it was Beth's day off. And Beth just wanted to get in and out of the Target store. Her mission, a pair of jeans for her second grader. She very pointedly headed down the aisles, selected the jeans, deciding to get two pairs instead of one. She grabbed a package of socks on her way to the register, and she was feeling pretty proud of herself for being very, very good in Target. She had only gotten basically what she came for and not spent, say, $150 on things she didn't plan to buy. So she decided to treat herself to a Starbucks on her way out the door because, you know, Starbucks is quite conveniently located at Target. So the woman ahead of her in line at the Starbucks counter was just chatting up a storm with the woman, the clerk at the register at Starbucks. Well, Beth was standing behind her telling herself that this extra minute that this woman was taking because she was chatty was not going to throw off Beth's entire day's schedule. She breathed in through her nose and out through her mouth, telling herself to think good thoughts about the woman. But in reality, she was standing there getting more and more irritated with Miss Chatty. All Beth wanted was her skinny vanilla latte and to get on with her day. And there was only one thing standing between Beth and her latte, and that was the chatty woman. Finally, Miss Chatty finished making her order, and then she turned to Beth and she said, Would you mind signing a birthday card for a complete stranger? And then Miss Chatty went on to say, my best friend is stuck in a hotel out of town on her birthday and she's also going through a nasty divorce and I just had this idea that getting this birthday card signed by random people would lift her spirits. Can we say aww? Beth, of course, said yes feeling that she had gotten her just desserts for her impatience. Well, as she stood at the pickup counter waiting for her skinny vanilla latte, she signed the birthday card, and it was also passed around to another, a number of other customers. And then the woman with the card finished up, and she headed out the door. But as Beth continued standing there waiting for her drink, she realized that the lady with the card had left without her caffeinated concoction. And so Beth grabbed the woman's drink and ran after her and gave it to her. As she was heading to her car, Beth was picturing what a nice thing this woman was doing. She was concerned about a friend who was lonely and going through hard times, and she thought of some simple act of kindness to make her life a little brighter. She may have been chatty, but she had put herself out there, risked a little bit with strangers, counting on the kindness of complete strangers to sign her card with the hope that it would cheer up her friend. The kindness of strangers. You can't depend on the kindness of strangers, but it can sure be a blessing when it happens. And here's what I want you to hear today, if you zone out or start filling out your pink paper during the sermon. You can be that blessing. You can be the stranger that offers the kindness. You know, when we hear that, we may think, oh, good, someday I'll be the recipient of such a kindness, and you probably have been and will be but you can be it. Today we're continuing our series on kindness, so join me in reciting our memory verse. It's on the front of your worship program. It's also on the screen for you. Um, and remember that I've challenged you to commit this to memory. You, if you started last week, you probably already got that down, but if not, put it on your fridge, at your workstation, um, on the dash of your car, and keep going over it until you've got it. Let's say it together. It's Ephesians 4.32. Be kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another as God in Christ has forgiven you. So last week when we started the series, we looked at probably the single most familiar Bible story about kindness, the story of the Good Samaritan. It's a parable. 
And we saw in that parable that it is not always the person that you would expect who extends kindness to others. Sometimes it's the person you would least expect, including with acts of kindness to strangers. But unlike last week's focus, the story of Rahab that we read today is not a parable. This is the real deal. It's not just a teaching story. This is one of the accounts along the way as the Israelites are moving toward entering the promised land. After Moses led the people out of slavery in Egypt, they wandered in the wilderness for 40 years, and then before they cross over finally into that land flowing with milk and honey, Moses dies. And it is Joshua who takes up leadership of the people to lead them into the promised land. And where we picked up reading today, they are poised to take the city of Jericho. Joshua wants to scout things out, and he sends a couple of spies to get firsthand information about how the residents of Jericho are viewing the impending invasion, what are they doing to get ready for it, they're supposed to go get that inside information. And so the spies slip into the edge of the city, visiting the house of a prostitute so as not to be detected, and it's this prostitute named Rahab. And her home was at the city's perimeter wall, in the city's perimeter wall, the scripture tells us. Well, word does get out that these two strangers visiting this woman's house are Israelites. And so the king finds out about it and he sends orders for some of his men to go and and to, to get Rahab to give up these men so that he can find out what they're up to. Well, instead of handing them over, Rahab chooses to take a great risk to herself and her household, and she denies that they are there and hides them from the king's men. Why would she do that? I mean, these are foreigners. They are the enemy. They are preparing to attack her city. They are strangers to her. She owes them nothing. And yet, she leads the king's men astray, sending them off looking. They're going down the Jordan River trying to find the men who were up on her roof the whole time. She's got them hiding up there. I mean, what kindness this is of her, unmerited kindness that she is offering to these strangers in her household. And then Rahab tells the spies what amounts to a testimonial. She says she has seen what their Lord has done. And it practically sounds like a confession of faith. I mean, listen, listen to this. She knows how the Lord helped the Israelites cross the Red Sea when they came out of Egypt and how they've been successful in battle against the Amorites. And she says, she is convinced that their Lord is the God of heaven and earth. And realizing the power of their God, knowing that the Israelites are going to be successful in taking Jericho, that that's their track record, she sees that, Rahab shows that she is wise. She is cunning. And so to the spies, she says, since I've dealt kindly with you, Swear to me by the Lord that you in return will deal kindly with my family. And she asks them to spare her and all of her extended family when the Israelites take the city. She asks for deliverance, for salvation. And the men promise it. They respond, our life for yours. If you do not tell this business of ours, then we will deal kindly and faithfully with you when the Lord gives us this land. So the Hebrew word there for kindly um, in both verses 12 and 14 is chesed. Our English words kind, kindly, kindness are are insufficient to really communicate um, the full meaning of chesed, which has this rich depth that indicates kind of layers of meaning. Loving kindness, mercy, goodwill is all wrapped up in this word. Rahab is no fool. Her choice of this loving kindness 
This mercy is no random act at all. She's crafty. Knowing the track record of the Israelites and their God, she knows that this may be an opportunity for reciprocity with these strangers. But she has no guarantees. She didn't know if this is going to work out. She didn't know if this bet is going to pay off. That's kind of the way it goes, right? I mean, with kindness to a stranger. I mean, once in a while you offer kindness to a, kindness to a stranger and it bites you back, right? Or you just never know if it does any good at all. We've got to be willing to act kindly, even if there may be no reward at all even if we may never have any idea if anything good came from it. A couple of tourists were visiting a small village near Venice, Italy, and they found a little local coffee shop that uh, they really liked. And, and so while staying in the community, they went to the coffee shop a few times. And it was quaint, and it kind of gave them a feel for the local culture. Um, and so on their first visit there, they were, they were just kind of taking it all in and they were listening to the conversations in Italian going on around them and trying to pick up what they could with their limited knowledge of the language. And they heard a man placing an order who said, two cups of coffee, one of them there on the wall. When the man left, the waiter put a piece of paper, pinned it to the wall that said, a cup of coffee. They thought this was odd, but the next time they were in the coffee shop, they heard other customers order in a similar way. They would, they would order two cups of coffee, they would drink one, and a little note would go on the wall. Well, after they watched this phenomenon a few times, thankfully, the tourists had an occasion to observe the other side of this situation. A man, poorly dressed, entered the coffee shop. He appeared to be of meager means. He was seated at a table, the waiter went to serve him, and the man placed his order. One cup of coffee from the wall. The waiter served the coffee to the man with the same dignity and respect that all the customers received there. The man had his coffee and then left without paying. The waiter took a piece of paper from the wall and tossed it in the bin. Now the tourists understood. The matter was perfectly clear. This was a kindness that that community offered to strangers, to neighbors, to anybody who needed it. The givers, the purchasers of the cup of coffee on the wall, might never have any idea who needed that or who it blessed. They didn't expect or get any immediate reward from their offering of that cup of coffee. The chesed, the kindness of Rahab, was kindness to strangers. She didn't have any idea which way it would go. But that kindness had a ripple effect. After she let the spies down from her home by a rope through the window at the wall of the city, they told her that when they invaded the land, that she must tie a crimson cord from that very same window, and that when the Israelites saw that cord, they would spare her and her household. And it was so. Her kindness came back upon her family in the immediate future when the walls of Jericho came tumbling down. But that kindness and the ripple effect from it didn't stop there. According to the Gospel of Matthew, Rahab is the mother of Boaz who married Ruth. This is in the genealogy of Jesus. And they were the parents of Obed, and Obed was the father of Jesse, and Jesse was the father of King David. 
And so Rahab had become the great-great-grandmother of King David. And from the line of David came another king, our king, Jesus, the Christ, the anointed one, the Messiah. And I know it may sound like a bit of a stretch, but it was Rahab's act of kindness that affected her salvation during the conquest of Jericho. And if she had not acted in kindness toward those spies, they would not have saved her, and she would not have been in the lineage of David and of Jesus. And so you can see that Rahab's kindness actually had a role in your salvation. You keep her on that line. So you are a secondary or maybe tertiary beneficiary of the kindness of Rahab. Thanks, Rahab. So what are you going to do about it? I question myself just about every week when I finish putting a sermon together and I say, well, so what? You ought to do that. You can do that after each of my sermons or anybody else's and go, okay, so what? So what difference does that make? So what are you going to do about this? If you know yourself to be saved through Christ, then it is a small thing to emulate Rahab's kindness towards strangers in your life. So last Sunday at the end of the service, I gave you three challenges, things that you could, practical ways you could go out and offer kindness to others. And I'm going to give you some more of those today. So I'm going to go back to the three that I gave you last week. Hey, by the way, anybody try any of those? Anybody? Anybody? Did you do any of them? Okay, well, I'll keep putting them out there on social media too and reminding you about it. So, and if you're not on the church's social media, get signed up, and then that way you'll, you'll get them, and, and we'll remind you of them. So, last week I gave you three challenges. The first one was um, to hold a door open for somebody out in public somewhere. So, let's just imagine that the person for whom you held a door open at a convenience store in the past week Well, they ended up, because of that, going into work with a better attitude that day. They were just kind of lifted up by that little act of kindness that you offered. And their boss kind of took note that they were just kind of up that day, and they they had a good attitude at their job. And the boss had been thinking about whether to give a raise to that person or not. And said, you know what, I'm going to act on that today. Which in turn helped that family get out of medical debt that had haunted them for years. You will never know that the door you held open at the convenience store had any effect whatsoever other than maybe a smile. But could it be? Or how about that putting away somebody's grocery cart thing? I gave you that one last week. You know, the ripple effect might not be as big as the one I just described with holding a door open, but maybe because you put away somebody's grocery cart on your last visit to the store, they did the same thing on their next visit to the store for somebody else. The third suggestion I gave you last week was uh, having to do with how you use social media, to use it to spread kindness rather than engage in conflictual things and negativity. So maybe in this past week, you resisted the urge to post political vitriol on Facebook. I hope you avoided that. And instead, stopped yourself and posted our memory verse. And you know, you felt better about yourself and about your world. But also, some of your Facebook friends shared that on their Facebook page. And then some of their friends shared it on theirs And these are strangers to you, but instead of spewing political hatred, you were the one who disseminated these words about being kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another as God in Christ has forgiven you. How hard is that? Amen.